in indigenous navigator. Well, fortunately, we have with us today, speakers have made these words meaningful in their everyday work and in their everyday lives. From the Danish Human Rights Institute, indigenous leaders from Tanzania, Cameroon, and Asia, a member of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues from Africa, the co-convener of the Indigenous People's Major Group on Sustainable Development Goals, the European Union delegation in New York, and also the International Labor Organization. Um, I will introduce the speakers when inviting them to speak. Uh, together with them, we will learn about the indigenous navigator as a practical tool and a strategic framework for empowering indigenous peoples for self-determined development and for effective engagement at different levels and spheres of governance. For many years, I have been interested in finding uh, different ways of making visible the everyday lives and experiences of indigenous peoples in ways which capture indigenous peoples' uh, realities and their underlying uh, contributions to the diversity and richness of nature and our societies. In the Indigenous Navigator, I have found such a tool for Indigenous peoples to tell our stories directly for ourselves and by ourselves, and to be able to share these stories and information with others with confidence, grounded on community research and knowledgeable about our human rights to equality and uh, non-discrimination. Uh, today, outside the walls of the United Nations in New York, there are resounding chants that Black Lives Matter. Inside the meeting, it is the mandate of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues to ensure that indigenous people's lives matter in economic, social, cultural, environment, health, and educational spheres. And this is the very purpose of the indigenous navigator, to highlight those issues that are important in our lives. Hopefully, this side event enriches the mandate of the UN Permanent Forum through sharing of experiences and collective discussions and showing ways forward towards peaceful and global solidarity. So um, these are the themes that we will be uh, covering. And um, I would like now to actually invite our first speaker, Ms. Birgitta Fering. She's the department director human rights and development in the Danish Institute for Human Rights. And uh, she will be making a presentation on the indigenous navigator uh, portal. Um, over to you, Birgitta. Thank you very much, Jody. And, and hello to everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Um, Georgia, I think you very eloquently uh, talked about the broad aspiration of the indigenous navigator. So I will concentrate on the more technical aspects um, of uh, the new indigenous navigator web portal that we are launching today. I'm really happy to be able to share with all of you the features of this revamped tool and portal. Uh, as some of, uh, of you will know, the consortium of indigenous navigator partners and allies have worked on this over the past seven to eight years with the aspiration to develop an approach, a framework and a set of tools that would allow indigenous peoples and communities to systematically monitor progress or setbacks uh, in achieving their rights. It has been a tremendous work it has involved partners and communities in countries across the globe. It has also, I want to highlight that, been a tremendous learning process 
There was no, no blueprint on how to do this when we set out uh, seven or eight years ago to, to, to develop these tools. So we have learned a lot in terms of methodology, design, advocacy, and much more. So I am actually very proud today on behalf of all the Indigenous Navigator partners that we are able to launch our new web portal where we have built in all the learning so far and I think developed a very unique set of tools that are tailored to Indigenous people's rights and needs. So please, um, David, if you can go to the next slide, please. I want to highlight first that this is really the result of collaborative efforts. During this past year of Corona, we have had six rounds of consultation with Indigenous navigator partners in 15 countries. Only very few of us, and not me, are experts on IT solutions and data. However, in spite of that, we have all brought our experience and knowledge uh, and we have co-created this new and rather sophisticated, I would say, uh, digital portal. We're building on the diversity of skills and knowledge, and we have made an effort to tailor this tool to the needs of communities. So what we have is a monitoring framework, a set of tools that measure progress against the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which is the central and foremost international instrument that reflect um, the range of Indigenous Peoples' rights. We have inserted into this framework additional links to underlying human rights, those that underpin the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and links to the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. Thereby, the monitoring done through the Indigenous Navigator can serve multiple purposes. The focus is, on the one hand, on developing national profiles. How is this or that country actually doing in terms of laws, policies, institutions, and efforts by the state to live up to their obligations and commitments on Indigenous people's rights? And, on the other hand, how are indigenous communities experiencing their reality, as Joji uh, mentioned? To what extent can these indigenous communities actually enjoy their rights? So these are complementary measurements that allow us also to measure the implementation gap between what are the obligations and commitments of states, what is the reality at the community level. And most importantly, we are not generating data for the sake of generating data. The indigenous navigator data is data for advocacy and for action. Data that can be reported to human rights monitoring mechanisms and others to measure countries' human rights performance. It is data that can, that can make sure that indigenous peoples are not left behind in SDG policies and plans including in the context of SDG 16 that we will further explore today. So David, if you can please move to the next slide. Uh, you are now seeing some screenshots from the Indigenous Navigator portal that has just gone on online. What you see here are the tools we have developed for data collection. These are integrated tools for communities and for compilation of data on the national situation. You have in the green box, you have fairly simple questions that the data provider, the data respondent should respond to. But right there, you also have the detailed guidance, the explanation about what elements of UN DRIP this question is measuring, how to understand the sometimes complicated terms of international human rights law. How do we understand forced labor? What is the scope of indigenous people's land rights? And you have guidance built into the portal right there on how to collect the data and you have links to further reading and resources that may be useful as you uh, start responding to the questions. So this tool monitors the full range of indigenous people's rights. It is 
subdivided into 12 thematic domains and the number of subcategories. This means that it's fairly easy to navigate the, the tools and you can, uh, you can actually focus on the domains and categories that are of particular importance and relevance to your community or to your country. Um, if we go to the next slide, please, David. All the data uh, at the indigenous, uh, in the indigenous navigator will be made available at the portal if the data providers give their consent. So you will only see the consensual data. Communities may want to withhold certain data or make use of the data exclusively for their own purposes. But those who give their consent uh, and, 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 and have entered the data into this global repository um, uh, make their data available. And as a data user, you will be able to filter and search and download the data for further processing and comparison. comparison. We have also uh, done some quite sophisticated calculations, uh, but to, in order to attach an index value, a numerical value to the different response options. So from good to bad. Uh, and that allows us to actually visualize the data to measure in numerical terms and graphically visualize how far a country, how far a community is in terms of, of, of uh, realizing the rights. So it allows us for a very visual comparison between communities, between community and national situation uh, and between countries. If you move to the next slide, David, uh, this is what we call final reports. And this is, I would say, a key feature and a quite unique feature of our revamped Indigenous Navigator uh, portal and something that we find very exciting. Because for many of us, it's difficult to go from crude data, numbers or graphic depictions to actually sending the message, getting the communication and message across. So the, future we, the feature we have worked on is that once you enter the data, you will get an automatically gener generated report back, which presents your data in a narrative way. Um, the, the final report is also available on the web. It can be downloaded, it can be printed, you can upload photos, etc. And that goes for both communities and for countries. Um, the report will highlight some of the more critical issues uh, revealed through the data and highlight again the gaps between the obligations and commitments of states and the realities in the communities. We think this is so important because it will give indigenous organizations, communities, support organizations, national human rights institutions, an immediate result in terms of a report that they can use for advocacy, for reporting, um, and it will help go in a seamless way from data collection to data-based advocacy and action. Because at the end of the day, this is data that should drive change and make sure that indigenous peoples can uh, fully enjoy their human rights. So if you just go to the final slide, um, I have just given you an appetizer and, and, and this portal has just gone online. Uh, there may still be some adjustments, so bear with us, but please feel free to provide your comments and remarks. Uh, and most of all, please make use of the tools that you will find there. There are indicators that you can make use of for your own monitoring purposes. There are data collection tools and there are, there's data there that you can use to substantiate your arguments about the need to support indigenous peoples. All of these are free resources that we very much hope you will find useful. And finally, I want to thank the EU for the generous support that has allowed the Indigenous Navigator Consortium to develop this uh, platform. Thank you very much and over to you again, Joji.
Thanks very much, uh, Brigitte. Um, that was indeed a very um, interesting taster of what can be found on the web portal of the Indigenous Navigator. As uh, having also been involved in uh, this uh, process, I can see how many improvements have uh, taken place as a result of um, consultations and listening to the needs of the partner uh, communities to make this uh, portal really accessible and uh, usable. So um, indeed, this uh, portal is um, external facing. Um, it allows um, governments, indigenous peoples, and everyone interested in indigenous rights to have a look at um, how well the UN declaration, the SDGs, and um, other global commitments are being met. And um, as exciting as the portal is, of course, uh, the real uh, life of the indigenous navigator is how it actually is used uh, by uh, communities, uh, indigenous peoples directly on the ground. Therefore, um, uh, I'm glad that our next set of speakers are indigenous panelists who have been leading in the application of the indigenous navigator tools. Uh, they can tell us about the types of data they have generated, the kinds of challenges, and um, give us really a taster of what it is to be using these tools. We have four indigenous uh, panelists from, uh, from um, Cameroon, uh, Tanzania, and from uh, Asia, and uh, they will be sharing uh, with us their uh, experiences from being the initial pilot communities and now uh, continuing partners in the Indigenous Navigator. Our first uh, speaker uh, to share will be Mr. Edward Porokwa. He is the Executive Director of the Pingos Forum, uh, the Pastoralists Forum in Tanzania. Um, Edward, I'd like you to uh, make your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, just I would like to start my presentation on uh, by talking about um, the situation with regards to particularly SDG 16, which is one of the very important uh, SDG for uh, indigenous people, because the, most of the issues that indigenous people are getting are institutional. And um, so definitely that is a part of the, of the, of the focus that we had on, uh, on implementation of the indigenous navigator. So, um given that situation we have conducted um, the baseline survey through the navigation to see the situation of indigenous people on different sdgs and in fact a lot of issues came out with regard to the situation of indigenous people among them are issues related to human rights and service delivery but particularly focusing on sdg 16 we have noted a lot of violation of human rights for indigenous people in different parts of the country. And uh, also a very big knowledge gap uh, of indigenous people on land right and human right. And uh, so that definitely in our implementation, uh, after conducting the baseline, we started to address some of the SDGs through the indigenous navigator. One of them is the trying to, to, to engage different relevant stakeholders, including the Commission of Human Rights and Good Governance, the National Bureau of Statistics, the local government authorities to ensure that, because they are the ones who deliver justice, but also services to indigenous people. So different activities have been conducted in that area, but also we conducted different workshops and training that involved indigenous people major decision-making bodies, village councils, relevant village committees, and um, those people that are having political decisions. 
So those are some of the issues that we try to do to ensure that the institutional framework is well understood by indigenous people and is used as a platform to address different issues that indigenous people have in relation to SDGs. We have conducted um, capacity building to the management and administration of the community pilot project area in locality that we have been working on to ensure that at least the indigenous people local and local uh, authorities are working hand in hand to ensure that there is an institutional framework that they to address some of their issues. With the baseline, several institutions within the government need capacity building and we have conducted such capacities, but also there's very little awareness in relation to uh, SDG, the UN DRIP, and uh, different policies, manuals, which are mostly in English. So we did a translation of SDGs into Kiswahili and used it for training of indigenous people to understand how they can address their issues within the, 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 the UN mechanisms and uh, other uh, mechanism available for them. We also targeted the land laws and policies in, uh, uh, is not translated in fact, but made simple uh, document that can inform indigenous on land use and policies. They can be able to use their knowledge on land laws and human rights when demand just for this. We conduct different radio programs uh, and TV programs to ensure that at least there's a lot of awareness of indigenous people on issues of uh, uh, land right on issues of uh, on use of the institution that are required to deliver the justice to them. We have also tried through the project to link indigenous people with decision makers, including the parliament, to ensure that they use those platforms platform, and, and local government authorities to ensure that they use those platforms uh, to address their issues. Some of the testimonies that we, we have noted in the process of addressing these issues because is that um, the indigenous people have been uh, uh, facing threat uh, from the, those who violate their, their rights. Even in addressing some of the issues that I'll mention a little bit more, they have been facing persecution, denial of access to justice to their community, delay of justice, the threats of the defenders, a number of violations of indigenous people that have been taking place. Now, going back to, to looking at the, the, the situation in Tanzania, the situation in Tanzania with regards to particularly uh, SDG 16 is such that we, for the last six years, we have been so much, the government has been so much depending on the president, the late president who passed away in March, rather than using the institution. They have been ignoring of institution. The Commission of Human Rights and Good Governance have been very uh, weak. The delivered the, the justice system have been very weak also. So access to justice has been a very big issue for indigenous people. This has resulted in different cases where indigenous people are having um, the evictions, including the Loliondo situation, that some of you might know where indigenous people have been evicted since 2017 and uh, they have the case in the court of uh, in the East African Court of Justice and we are trying to use that also as a mechanism to use institutions to address these issues and also doing advocacy on creating strong institutions um, and uh, the other the other th threat that indigenous people have been identified to have is the issue of a vision of indigenous people in Gorongoro. Just last week, for example, the government of Tanzania uh, said they want to remove the people, 100,000 people from Gorongoro, and they have started by giving the number, the, the names of the people that they have, they need to, to remove, and they want to expand the protected areas from 8,000 kilometer, 8,100 kilometer square to 12,000 kilometer squares, which will definitely affect indigenous people. So there are all these issues, including uh, uh, mega
like uh, soda ash project in Engaruka, which indigenous people are likely to have been used as a mechanism to raise the voice on the use of different institutions and on the use of uh, the freedom of expression to ensure that issues of indigenous people are being put forward and that and train indigenous people to ensure to, to know that the institutions that are available can provide redress to some of the issues that they they they, they want to, to address. So in short, this is my short presentation with regards to um, indigenous navigator project and the testimonies on the ground because we have several cases of people that have been uh, uh, prosecuted, several people that have been denied justice. And I hope this can see with regard um okay F thanks very much um edward for your uh, presentation um from your presentation it comes across that uh, you have generated quite a lot of information and uh, you have then used uh, this uh, information to uh, approach those um, government agencies and other uh, institutions that have um, obligations to uphold uh, the rights of indigenous peoples. Um, you have also brought out uh, testimonies and um, cases of evictions from uh, protected areas and uh, emergence of uh, development projects which have not uh, fully consulted uh, indigenous peoples. You know, um, being familiar with the questionnaires in the indigenous navigator, you will be surprised how much data can be generated because it is quite uh, comprehensive. And so you have highlighted how uh, this has allowed you to um, address institutional and structural issues with respect to the rights of uh, indigenous peoples in Tanzania. Um, let us hear some more from other indigenous uh, panelists. This time, let us go to Cameroon and we have two presenters from uh, Cameroon. Mr. Timothy Emini, who is from uh, the Okani organization and also uh, McKnight and Sho from the Forest People's Program who have been working together in uh, applying the indigenous navigator tools in, the, uh, in Cameroon. Um, can I invite uh, Timothy to please uh, make your presentation? Bien, bonsoir. Uh, je vais m'exprimer en français. Bonsoir à toutes. Et à tous euh, venant de part et d'autre dans le monde. Comme euh, Jody l'a dit, je suis euh, Emini Timothée de l'association Okani. Et euh, nous sommes euh, basés dans la région de l'Est euh, au Cameroun. Alors, euh, je vais faire la présentation suivant euh, la mise en œuvre du projet Navigateur autochtone au Cameroun dans son ensemble et aussi euh, la spécificité qu'on a mis sur euh, les objectifs de, de développement durable, surtout l'objectif euh, 16. Euh, slide suivant. Alors, au Cameroun, nous avons mis euh, le projet navigateur autochtone euh, sous l'égide de l'association Okani. Et comme je l'ai dit, c'est une association des BACA euh, basée à l'Est, aussi avec euh, le, le grand accompagnement de euh, la plateforme euh, autochtone Babandi et bien évidemment avec notre partenaire, euh, le Forest People's Program, FPP. Next.
Next slide. Voilà. Notre contribution à la mise en œuvre de l'ODD 16. L'un des objectifs du navigateur autochtone était de contribuer à, cette, à la mise en œuvre de ces objectifs. Et on sait, lorsqu'on a fait des études, des enquêtes communautaires, on s'est rendu compte qu'il y avait nécessité, vu le, le niveau de mise en œuvre euh, pas évident, pas très clair de la Déclaration des Nations Unies euh, sur les droits des peuples autochtones au Cameroun. Et nous avons pensé qu'il fallait mener des actions euh, d'accompagnement des communautés euh, sur l'obtention des actes de naissance, parce que euh, ce sont les fondamentaux qui peuvent assurer euh, le droit à la citoyenneté, dont l'accès à la justice, à l'éducation, et à l'emploi au Cameroun. Et l'autre euh, voie qu'on a utilisée pour euh, contribuer à la mise en œuvre de cette ODD 16 était l'utilisation des messages de plaidoyer euh, sur la prise en compte des droits des peuples autochtones dans tous les aspects du fonctionnement de l'administration euh, au Cameroun. Et si on a impliqué euh, les peuples autochtones, on arrive à une construction de la paix durable, puisqu'on est sûr que si on ne laisse personne pour compte et on, on implique aussi les communautés autochtones dans le fonctionnement de l'État, dans le fonctionnement de l'administration du Cameroun, bien évidemment, on aura une paix inclusive et les peuples autochtones aussi seront représentés dans toutes les sphères. Euh, next slide. Voilà. Lorsque nous avons commencé la mise en œuvre du projet navigateur autochtone au Cameroun euh, depuis 2018 jusqu'à ce jour en 2021, les données que nous avons collectées nous ont renseignées sur la situation actuelle de la citoyenneté des peuples autochtones au Cameroun, spécifiquement les peuples autochtones de forêt. Et on s'est rendu compte que lorsque nous avons fini d'étudier les données, que 69% d'enfants autochtones de moins de 5 ans n'ont pas d'acte de naissance. Et ce qui représente deux fois la moyenne nationale, il faut rappeler qu'au Cameroun, la moyenne nationale des enfants n'ayant pas les actes de naissance est de 30-33 On s'est aussi rendu compte que 47 des peuples autochtones sont sans citoyenneté reconnue, dont sans acte de naissance et sans euh, carte nationale d'identité. Et plus loin, l'autre donnée nous a montré que 36 des peuples autochtones sont sans carte d'électeur donc ne peuvent ni contribuer au jeu électoral, donc au droit de vote, et eux-mêmes ne peuvent pas aspirer au poste électif euh, dans ce contexte-là. Et de manière globale, la, la requête qui a été formulée dans les communautés était que l'établissement de naissance, de l'acte de naissance, a été identifié comme une priorité clé pour les peuples autochtones. Et c'est sur cette base de la demande communautaire que le navigateur s'est penché sur un micro-projet, dont l'établissement des actes de naissance. Next slide. Next. Voilà. La question autour de l'acte de naissance pour un individu au Cameroun est pertinente parce qu'au Cameroun, c'est un document fondamental pour la reconnaissance de l'existence juridique de tout citoyen et c'est aussi le fondement même de la nationalité. Et chez nous, on dit, si vous n'avez pas un acte de naissance, vous n'existez pas juridiquement. Et c'est le cas qui prévaut dans la plupart des communautés autochtones que nous avons euh, enquêtées. Ça veut dire que plusieurs euh, communautés autochtones vivent sans une reconnaissance juridique parce que ne détenant pas un acte de naissance. L'acte de naissance sert de base pour établir toutes les autres pièces officielles au Cameroun. Sans acte de naissance, on ne peut pas établir une carte nationale d'identité, on ne peut pas euh, établir euh, une carte d'électeur, et si vous n'avez pas ces euh, éléments de base qui confirment votre citoyenneté, votre nationalité, alors là, vous serez sujet à toute violation de droit, vous serez sujet à toute discrimination, parce que les autres tours vont se baser sur le fait que vous ne détenez pas une pièce officielle. Et le dernier point sur l'importance de l'acte de naissance, c'est que c'est la clé qui ouvre les portes à la pleine jouissance des multiples droits civils 
et politique, dont l'inscription à l'école, euh, le voyage dans le pays, le droit de vote et l'accès à la justice. Et si un citoyen dont les peuples autochtones ne, ne, ne jouissent pas complètement de ces éléments-là, alors là, la question est de la citoyenneté où la mise en œuvre de l'ODD-16 est a priori euh, problématique parce qu'on ne pourra pas arriver à une finalité où on retrouve les peuples autochtones véritablement participatifs. Alors, si les peuples autochtones des forêts du Cameroun doivent aspirer à toute vie civile, politique et autre, la question de l'acte de naissance se présente alors comme euh, une question qui doit être réglée systématiquement. Next slide. Alors, pendant la mise en œuvre ou pendant la collecte des informations autour des communautés, on s'est rendu compte qu'il y avait des obstacles liés à l'établissement des actes de naissance en milieu autochtone. Déjà, il y avait le manque d'informations. Les gens n'ont pas la bonne information et l'information exacte sur les délais légaux d'établissement gratuit et direct d'un acte de naissance. Il y a les longues distances à parcourir entre les communautés loin dans les villages, parfois en forêt, et les centres d'état civil qui sont habilités à établir officiellement et de manière authentique les actes de naissance. Il y a une complexité autour des prix, des coûts. Si vous partez d'un centre d'état civil à un autre, ça varie, on ne sait, on ne sait même pas très bien pourquoi est-ce que les, les prix sont, ne sont pas stables. Il y a aussi, la majorité des naissances sont malheureusement faites en forêt parce que les populations se meuvent vers la forêt pour leur vie, pour la culture, et parfois, lorsqu'il y a des naissances en forêt, ce n'est pas évident de partir de la forêt et de se rendre dans un centre de santé et un centre d'état civil. Et enfin, il y a les traitements discriminatoires. Lorsque les, 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 les Autochtones arrivent devant les centres d'état civil, il y a toujours des considérations discriminatoires qui limitent, qui frustrent et qui font en sorte que les communautés n'aient pas le courage de repartir vers les centres d'état civil pour établir les actes de naissance. Next. Next slide. Alors, nous avons aussi, lors de la mise en œuvre de, de, du navigateur, constaté qu'il avait des obstacles à la jouissance du droit à la citoyenneté. Et c'était lié au faible, ou alors à la faible détention des documents officiels que nous avons évoqués plus haut. Il y a une faible politique nationale d'intégration des peuples autochtones dans la sphère politico-administrative. Le, le gouvernement n'a véritablement pas encore pris en compte la question des quotas, la question de, 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 de contact, de consultation des communautés autochtones pour effectivement impliquer ces communautés-là, nous impliquer dans la sphère administrative et politique au Cameroun. Il y a au Cameroun une absence de loi nationale sur les droits des peuples autochtones, contrairement à beaucoup de pays voisins en Afrique centrale qui ont suffisamment évolué sur la question des droits, la question des lois nationales protégeant spécifiquement les, les droits des peuples autochtones. Il y a enfin aussi un faible intérêt des leaders autochtones à s'activer passionnément dans le jeu politique, comme pour dire que la spécificité du Cameroun pour aller plus loin et influencer les politiques, il faut au préalable être dans le jeu politique et se positionner dans cette sphère-là. Next slide. Alors, lorsque nous avons fini de faire la collecte des données, des informations actualisées autour des communautés sous la base d'une enquête communautaire, l'objectif du micro-projet sous l'égide du navigateur autochtone et contribuant aussi à la mise en œuvre de l'ODD-16, était de faciliter de manière pilote l'accompagnement et l'établissement de 500 actes de naissance aux enfants autochtones, donc 300 dans la région de l'Est pour la spécificité des populations autochtones de clan Baka et 200 actes dans la région du Sud vers l'océan pour euh, euh, contribuer à la spécificité des, des enfants autochtones Bagheli. Donc, et cette euh, action a été focalisée aussi sur la sensibilisation, la formation et l'accompagnement des communautés autochtones 
à l'obtention des, des actes de naissance. Parce qu'on s'est dit, peut-être après le micro-projet, après le navigateur autochtone, il faut bien que les communautés aient les informations exactes sur les délais et comment est-ce qu'on procède pour l'obtention des, des, des actes de naissance. Next slide. Alors, partant de, du postulat de 500 actes au départ, les résultats que nous avons réalisés sur le terrain sont que nous avons à ce jour 580 actes de naissance en cours de transcription pour les enfants BACA, soit un pourcentage de 116 de réalisation. Et la, le, la procédure voulait qu'il y ait des, une étape des jugements supplétifs au niveau des tribunaux, au niveau des palais de justice. Nous avons pu réaliser 420 jugements supplétifs et les formations que nous avons menées sur le terrain ont reproduit des résultats de 160 déclarations directes dont les relais communautaires qui ont été formés ont travaillé pendant cette mise en œuvre à réaliser le fait qu'on ne soit plus en train d'aller vers la justice, mais faire des déclarations directes dans les communautés. L'autre résultat, c'est que 15 sages-femmes traditionnelles et 15 relais communautés autochtones ont été formés sur l'enrichissement des naissances. Il y a eu dans cette... Euh, dans cette procédure, dans, cette, dans ce projet, nous avons procédé à un renforcement de collaboration avec les services de l'État, les collectivités territoriales décentralisées et les chefferies traditionnelles. Parce qu'il faut le rappeler par le passé, les rapports entre les organisations travaillant pour les, les peuples autochtones et les services de l'État n'étaient pas toujours évidents. Mais pendant, cette, pendant le micro-projet ou le navigateur autochtone, nous avons réalisé qu'il y a eu un, un renforcement de collaboration, un grand apprentissage sur la mobilisation communautaire et aussi une collaboration avec les médias nationaux. Next slide. Pendant le micro projet, le, le navigateur autochtone, nous avons pu produire quelques documents, dont la fiche d'information qui renseigne sur la situation actuelle, les données actualisées sur les droits des peuples autochtones et le niveau de mise en œuvre des, des, des objectifs de développement durable. Nous avons produit euh, un document sur le droit à la citoyenneté des peuples autochtones. Ça nous renvoie un peu sur la situation actuelle de la citoyenneté des peuples autochtones au Cameroun. Et enfin, nous avons mené une étude de cas sur euh, l'historique, la, la situation de l'État civil au Cameroun et spécifiquement en faveur des peuples autochtones. Next slide. Alors, l'objectif aussi du navigateur était de procéder au message de plaidoyer au Cameroun. Et nous avons, au sein de, de la plateforme des peuples autochtones Babandi, euh, lancé quelques messages clés et essentiels vis-à-vis -vis du gouvernement du Cameroun. Il faut ouvrir les centres d'état civil secondaires à proximité des peuples autochtones parce qu'on s'est rendu compte qu'il y avait de fortes distances qu'il fallait parcourir, or qu'il y a des, une densité de population où il n'existe pas des centres d'état civil secondaires. Il faut que les, les autorités locales, les, les autorités administratives puissent sélectionner et établir les leaders autochtones comme secrétaires d'état civil pour faciliter la communication et ce travail d'établissement des actes de naissance auprès des communautés. Il faut que l'État du Cameroun organise systématiquement des audiences foraines partir de leur bureau des de, de, de palais de justice et aller faciliter les jugements supplétifs auprès des communautés. Il faut enfin que l'État puisse appliquer une politique d'indulgence dans les services des palais de justice pour que lorsque les communautés autochtones arrivent, qu'elle ne soit plus soumise à des contraintes ou à, de, à des exigences financières qui sont euh, euh, volumineuses et qui sont très coûteuses pour les communautés autochtones qui n'ont pas assez de moyens pour payer ce genre de services. Next slide. Alors, au terme de la mise en œuvre du projet navigateur autochtone et le micro-projet, en mettant une spécificité sur l'ODD-16, 
nous voulons présenter toute notre gratitude à tous les partenaires et à tous les donateurs du projet Navigateur autochtone parce que c'est un outil qui est venu euh, réveiller, actualiser les données au Cameroun et qui est venu nous donner des arguments pour encore aller vers euh, l'administration, échanger avec l'administration, donner des éléments qui vont permettre à ce que les institutions étatiques puissent effectivement travailler avec euh, des éléments, des informations sur pour que euh, le, le, le changement, le développement que l'État doit apporter ou faciliter en faveur des communautés autochtones soit euh, efficace et qu'on ressente un véritable changement. Sur ce, je vous remercie pour votre aimable attention. Merci. Um, thank you very much, Timothy, for that very uh, concrete uh, explanation of how you were able to use the navigator for the benefit of um, the children and the communities. Um, I'd like to invite um, McKnight and Sho from the Forest People's Program if you want to supplement what uh, Timothy has shared. Thank you very much, Tim. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you now, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Can you so hear I, us? Okay. So I, I was just saying that um, I don't have anything further to add. But okay. if there are questions at the end, then I'll be happy to answer. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you very much for that uh, presentation of um, uh, the process in Cameroon. So now we will go to um, Asia and uh, we have um, Mr. Sri Kumar. He's the Deputy Secretary General of the Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact in Thailand, which is one of the partner organizations in the Indigenous Navigator Consortium. Um, Sri. Uh, please uh, share your experience. Thank you, Zuzi. Thank you for your brief introduction about the... I'll share my screen. For, for those who don't know about Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact, it's a, a regional organization of indigenous peoples, a regional organization of indigenous peoples, and we have 47 member organizations in in Asia. Can you see my screen now? I'll make it full screen. Yes. Okay, so let me start my presentation. I think it's coming, full screen is coming up. So uh, there is no doubt the, all the uh, 17 goals 17 SDG goals are equally important for indigenous people. However, the sixth uh, goal number 16 is important and significantly important because it has emphasized on uh, promotion of uh, peaceful and inclusive, inclu uh, inclusive sustainable development and access to justice for all the, uh, all, Access, access to justice for all and access to uh, also the accountable and inclusive and uh, inclusive uh, institutions at all level. Moreover, this goal has also specific targets on a significant reduction of all forms of discrimination, violence, and ending abuse and exploitations, no? trafficking uh, uh, of the women's and all forms of violence. So this is very much important uh, because it has been emphasizing on strengthening uh, the relevant, uh, relevant institutions and international corporations for 
dealing with those kind of uh, issues, no? all forms of violence. No? So the goal 16, which is uh, emphasizing on peace and justice, which is very much important for indigenous people. And it has uh, emphasized on dealing with these kind of multiple issues and challenges faced by indigenous peoples in relation to peace, justice, and insec uh, insecurity conflicts and weak institutions. No? Uh, at the same time, indigenous peoples have been facing serious inequalities, violence, violations on human rights, including the killings of uh, criminalizations and protecting for protecting their lands, their territories and resources, which is, uh, uh, there, there are multiple reports related to that. And uh, there has been increased human trafficking rates, uh, the cases of rape and sexual assault among the indigenous women. And one of the example in, in case of Nepal, out of 10, seven, seven uh, such cases are found in indigenous women. Uh, at the same time, 176 cases of violence against women, girls, including social violence, rape, and attempt to rape and murder cases, uh, especially in the case, uh, in the situation of this COVID-19. At the same time, the government has been doing some kind of uh, criminal activities. And one of the example is also, we, you can see uh, in Myanmar and also uh, in case of Laos and, and Thailand, there are multiple such kind of uh, issues which indigenous peoples have been facing throughout the history. Indigenous people uh, leaders, especially the IPHRDs, are actually in a serious threat because they have been uh, raising the voices in uh, this kind of development and investment projects, including the extractive industries and la large uh, infrastructure related projects. So they, they, they are uh, very much in the risk no? So this, uh, this is a serious issue. Uh, and just to give you some brief background, no? like in uh, the 18 sessions of the United Nations, uh, United, the Permanent Forum uh, on the issues, indigenous issues, focused on the theme of indigenous people's uh, traditional knowledge, knowledge, generation and transmission of the protection, transmission and protection of those knowledge for the roles of indigenous peoples for the successful implementation of goals and indigenous peoples have been contributing to implement this kind of goals throughout uh, since the beginning and it will be continuous throughout the period of uh, SDG 2013. This session has actually recommended for uh, creating uh, international uh, expert groups of indigenous peoples for implementing the uh, sustainable development goals uh, basically the goal number 16, uh, emphasizing role, uh, peace, justice, and strong in, uh, institutions. And uh, the linkage with the indigenous navigator now, because we are uh, currently launching the uh, new, new format of this indigenous navigator. And indigenous navigator as uh, previous uh, uh, speaker already mentioned that it, it is very much important and innovative ways or innovative to framework having uh, tools which is generating the first hand information of indigenous people uh, re regarding their the current situations the reality in the in the ground including the systematic documentation and monitoring of, monitoring of this the cases and it also helped in reporting those cases of human rights violations, criminali criminalizations, and recognition of their rights. Through this uh, indigenous navigator, indigenous people's organizations, and indigenous people's, uh, including the communities and other stakeholders, including government and UN agencies, state and non-state actors can access the support of uh, support for the effective implementation of SDGs and appropriately, appropriately utilizing the generated data and information for their advocacy for, for, for their uh, lobby work and negotiations in, in different processes and different mechanisms. And this indigenous navigator also enables in monitoring of the current situations, including the rights and recognitions in, in the development and investment uh, investment by
by the government and also the uh, other other multi state multinational companies. So, what is needed? So, it is very much crucial to have or ensure the access to justice of the indigenous uh, peoples, particularly uh, indigenous women and indigenous persons with disabilities in the formal judicial systems based on the recognition and the rights of rights which has been enshrined in the UN DRIP and uh, ILO 169, and at the same time, recognition of their customary, customary law and uh, customary institutions. It is also important to have uh, uh, some kind of targeted in initiatives so that it will be uh, helpful for providing the legal identities of the indigenous uh, peoples because the number of indigenous peoples, uh, even in Asia also, they, they don't have uh, their citizenship as uh, mentioned by uh, uh, my friend earlier. The, the uh, citizenship issue is uh, very serious in most of the countries in Asia as well. So the, the, those kind of uh, legal identities is important for their education, their right to health, and their right to uh, access to the health services and all. So it is also important to take the in immediate steps to protect the indigenous peoples uh, or indigenous women's human rights uh, because these human rights defenders are uh, and the environment, inner environmental activities are uh, at risk because they have been raising their voices for defending their lands, uh, their rights to land, territory, and resources. And it is also important to have the respect of indigenous governance, including self determination and uh, autonomy systems, uh, and customary laws and policies, which is uh, very much important for indigenous peoples because they, the indigenous peoples have been continuing or practicing these uh, systems for generations. So those recognition is very much important for indigenous peoples to continue uh, the peace, justice, and, and their uh, strong institutions throughout their, uh, uh, their life and well-being. So with this, uh, I would uh, conclude my presentation. And these are the, some of the reference uh, used for the presentation. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Sri. So hearing directly from the indigenous um, presentations, um, we have seen how inclusive societies is uh, extremely, well, it's the goal of uh, SDG 16. And yet issues of citizenship and legal recognition, um, issues of um, uh, continuing uh, discrimination, and also issues of uh, human rights uh, defenders for those who are um, defending uh, lands and territories. So um, thank you very much for highlighting those uh, important aspects of SDG 16 and how the uh, indigenous navigator has allowed you to generate the data and to understand deeply the needs and priorities of the communities. So now uh, we will be turning to um, other speakers. This time they will be highlighting issues of strengthening uh, dialogue and partnership uh, from uh, other institutions within uh, society. And um, our very first speaker for this session is Mr. Vital Bambanse. He is a member of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues from Africa. And, um, he will uh, speak to us about these issues. Um, uh, Vital, please uh, make your presentation. Uh, thanks, Madam Joji Kalina, and uh, good morning, good evening for everybody. I'm very happy to uh, have had this invitation to speak during this session. Uh, as I've said, I'm going to speak in French. I think uh, my colleagues uh, who do not speak French can uh, take their mics. Uh, merci beaucoup, uh, Madame uh, Georgie, présidente de cette séance, et pour uh, m'avoir associé à cette uh, session d'importance capitale. Et je remercie aussi Yves Guillaume, surtout uh, David, qui uh, a tenu à 
à communiquer euh, avec nous pour que nous puissions comme, euh, participer à cette session. Euh, comme José l'a dit, euh, moi je suis euh, honorable Vital Bambanze, je suis de la communauté Batoua du Burundi, euh, membre de l'instance permanente des Nations Unies sur euh, les questions euh, autochtones et nommé par euh, les États africains. Euh, C'est euh, un avantage pour moi, je dirais que c'est même quelquefois extraordinaire d'avoir un autochtone nommé par les États parce que souvent on nous considère comme des personnes non capables. Et je remercie les, en, les anciens orateurs qui nous ont édifiés en nous montrant ce qu'ils ont déjà fait et avec le système du navigateur. Revenons sur le thème qui m'a a été demandé à donner un peu d'informations. Je pense que ce n'est pas une session que je vais présenter. C'est surtout un, un échange qui va me permettre justement d'échanger euh, avec les intervenants et les autres participants pour que justement on puisse voir comment on peut mener un dialogue fructueux entre les peuples autochtones et les institutions de l'État les organisations du système des Nations Unies et les ONG qui travaillent dans un, un ensemble euh, général dans la promotion et la protection euh, des droits d'une façon générale et les droits des peuples autochtones d'une façon, façon euh, particulière. Alors, le thème euh, sur euh, l'ODD 16, la paix et la justice, euh, et les conflits, l'insécurité, la faiblesse des institutions. Euh, la limite de l'accès à la justice euh, qui bloque le développement durable de toutes les filles et fils de la nation est un exemple vraiment frappant et, et c'est un peu visible dans les communautés autochtones. Les conflits se manifestent euh, plus euh, amplement dans le domaine du foncier, où on remarque les accaparements des terres des peuples autochtones et des insécurités naissent quand il s'agit, euh, euh, quand il revient aux peuples autochtones de défendre euh, les droits et euh, les assassinats en surviennent ou en suivent. Il y a des cas les plus frappants. Euh, dans la région d'Afrique centrale et surtout en République démocratique du Congo, euh, vous allez euh, comprendre que depuis 20 ans, il y a eu des cas d'assassinat dans la République démocratique du Congo, il y a eu des cas d'assassinat euh, au Rwanda, au Burundi, en République, en, au Cameroun, euh, dans d'autres pays. Et cela... Euh, les conflits qui continuent, qui naissent dans des zones où vivent les peuples autochtones, amènent avec eux euh, le manque de respect de leurs droits suite aux institutions ou euh, à la faiblesse des institutions de l'État. Euh, au moment où on vous parle, euh, je voudrais euh, adresser mes sincères condoléances euh, au peuple du Tchad. Euh, euh, qui vient de perdre le président, euh, son excellence euh, Idriss Déby, qui est tombé sur le champ de bataille en train euh, de combattre le Robert. C'est un exemple concret qui montre que même actuellement, il y a de l'insécurité, il y a des conflits au niveau de l'Afrique, et là, ça amène des faibles institutions, et ces faibles institutions amènent des conséquences directes sur les peuples qui sont faibles. Et dans les zones d'Israël, les peuples Bororo, les peuples Peul, ont toujours été victimes de conflits qui se vissent dans ces régions à cause justement de faibles institutions ou je dirais même le manque de la bonne gouvernance. Les faibles institutions, quand on en parle, on ne peut pas oublier le manque de respect des droits euh, de tous les citoyens et justement la catégorisation euh, des peuples où quelquefois même on voit que certains peuples sont un peu inférieurs par rapport aux autres. C'est le cas alors 
des peuples autochtones qui sont toujours placés euh, derrière les autres ou considérés comme des citoyens de euh, seconde zone et ainsi ils peuvent ne pas avoir accès aux droits fonciers, droits à la santé, droits à l'éducation et même le droit de participer aux instances de prise de décision, d'où, euh, par exemple, les peuples autochtones qui ne sont pas éduqués, qui ne sont pas, qui n'ont pas accès à la santé, se voient toujours comme des peuples minoritaires. C'est dans ce cadre-là que euh, euh, les peuples autochtones ont le devoir de revendiquer de, pour être reconnus entièrement par les institutions de l'État comme des citoyens à part entière, lesquels les citoyens doivent jouir des mêmes droits comme les autres peuples. Cela dit que si les gens parlent des questions des peuples autochtones, on ne réclame pas, ils ne réclament pas les peuples autochtones les droits supplémentaires. Ils réclament des droits qui sont reconnus par le mécanisme où les institutions internationales de droits de l'homme et les instruments internationaux de droits de l'homme, dont euh, la Déclaration universelle des droits de l'homme, la, la Déclaration des Nations unies sur les droits des peuples autochtones, et la Commission africaine des droits de l'homme, la Charte africaine, tout ça qui montre que nous avons le droit à la dignité, droit à l'égalité, droit à l'autodétermination. Laquelle autodétermination comme on l'entend en Afrique, définit que l'homme n'est indépendant et n'a, ne peut pas être objet de discrimination ou objet de euh, marginalisation euh, et n'a pas droit d'être, euh, dont les droits ne vont pas être euh, violés. Euh, dans ce cas-là, je vois que le temps est limité. J'inviterai que les institutions étatiques les ONG internationales, les agences des Nations Unies doivent, doivent être ensemble pour qu'on puisse définir quelle ligne droite nous devons prendre en tant qu'institution, l'instance permanente, le mécanisme des experts des Nations Unies sur les droits des peuples autochtones, euh, le rapport spécial sur les droits et libertés fondamentales des peuples autochtones pour que justement, tout le monde puisse jouir des droits reconnus et à tout être humain et, et, et lesquels droits euh, le sont reconnus à la naissance. C'est-à-dire que chacun doit jouir de ses droits dans l'État-nation où il est né. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much, uh, Vital, for underlining the need for uh, collaboration and working together uh, to address these uh, issues. And in fact, our next speaker has been uh, one of the very active uh, indigenous uh, persons working within the UN and working with uh, wide networks of indigenous peoples because she is the co-convener of the indigenous peoples major group working on uh, sustainable development. Um, we know, many of us know her. Um, Joanne Carling will be our next uh, speaker. Yeah. Joanne, please. Yes, uh, good day to everyone. Um, the topic given to me is on the pathways uh, of dialogue and partnership to advance SDG 16. And uh, just to us to echo what others have mentioned as the very framework of uh, achieving peace, justice, and strong institutions uh, require the, the full respect, recognition, and protection of the individual and collective rights of indigenous peoples. Uh, we cannot have peace or justice without the recognition of indigenous peoples' rights. Unfortunately, 80% uh, majority of the 80% of indigenous peoples that are in Asia and Africa do not have legal recognition, much more or a recognition of their collective rights. So if we look at this situation, then we can already anticipate 
that these indigenous peoples without legal recognition are sub subject to uh, human rights violations and not only uh, lack of access to justice, but denial of justice simply because they don't exist legally from the eyes of the of the state and they and they don't have any collective rights as indigenous peoples so with this uh, uh situation what we then need as part of a pathway to peace and, and, and justice and strong institutions is to engage in a constructive dialogue in good faith. We hope that there is good faith on the part of states to engage in a dialogue with indigenous peoples because they, are, they made a commitment to respect uh, human rights and, and they have clear human rights uh, uh, obligations and, and commitments as part of the, of the UN system. So when we say uh, they, they, the engagement for a, a good faith dialogue between indigenous peoples and states uh, should be around how indigenous peoples rights are going to be respected, upheld, and that indigenous peoples fulfill these rights. And we see this, for example, in the many recommendations of, of states in the human rights system uh, pertaining to uh, indigenous people's rights is related to goal 16, because a lot of complaints filed by indigenous peoples within the UN system reflects the, the widespread conflicts in indigenous territories because of land grabbing, because of violation of free prior and informed consent uh, in projects being implemented in indigenous territories uh, that's from the private sector and, and, and from states. So many of, 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 the, of the UN system are making recommendations for states to respect free prior and informed consent, to respect the rights of indigenous peoples to their lands, territories, and resources as an enabling environment for peace in indigenous territories. So if only states will implement these recommendations uh, in accordance to their human rights obligations and commitments, then we can say that these are clear steps to achieve peace in indigenous uh, territories. When, when we also speak of strong institutions, it doesn't mean authoritarian governments uh, that are uh, uh, poised to quell the rights of, of not only indigenous peoples, but also the right to speak, the right to, to assembly, these fundamental rights and, and freedoms. Because I want to stress this because this is also an important dimension in, when we talk of, of, of rights of indigenous peoples in achieving peace and, and, um, and uh, justice, because these individual rights enable us to, to participate in a non-discriminatory way, as, as Vital has mentioned a while ago, we like other uh, citizens. Now, the other uh, dimension of, an, of a, a pathway to achieving peace and, and, and justice is also to engage in a dialogue with the private sector, particularly business and investors who are uh, in, uh, in, involved in violating the rights of indigenous peoples uh, simply because there is no legal framework for the protection of indigenous people's rights to their lands, territories, and resources. So it's easy for this private sector and investors to come in and take uh, the, the resources of indigenous peoples. So when we say dialogue with the private sector, we also refer to uh, the UN principles on business and human rights as the, as the underlying framework for this kind of a dialogue wherein uh, it's the responsibility, the duty also of um, the private sector, business and investors 
to ensure that uh, the rights of indigenous are respected, especially in relation to lands, territories, and resources, and pre, prior, and informed uh, consent. And, I, and, and this is possible that, that a partnership can even evolve between indigenous peoples and the private sector if it's, this is clearly, clearly within the framework of respecting indigenous uh, people's rights and equity for indigenous peoples to have equitable uh, sharing of benefits, which is also important in achieving the sustainable development goals. Uh, we see, for example, potential of this under uh, for the targets on uh, access to renewable energy. And, and, and finally, just to, uh, just to mention that we also need partnerships with, with UN uh, agencies because UN agencies have the mandate uh, to work with rights holders and duty bearers, the states and the rights holders, including indigenous peoples, to ensure that rights, uh, uh, that sustainable development is also underpinned by the human rights. So they become our natural allies and they can facilitate, they can bridge um, dialogues with both the states and the, and the private sector. But more importantly is also that, that UN uh, agencies have, have the means you know, to, uh, to support and provide assistance to indigenous peoples in, on issues uh, relating to, to peace and justice. Uh, for example, the Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights can help amplify this, the, the worsening situation of indigenous peoples in relation to our rights. And uh, finally, just to say that the important partnership that we need to strengthen is also the partnership and cooperation on the spirit of uh, solidarity and collaboration with other sectors, uh, allies, the, the advocate groups, human rights institutions, um, and others that are working on indigenous people's rights or related issues, even climate change, for example, biodiversity, because we, we need to promote the holistic approach uh, to sustainable development that is underpinned by uh, the respect for human rights and also the sustainability of, uh, of our, our uh, planet. And, and that we can only achieve that if there is peace and justice in indigenous territories and that indigenous peoples can finally um, also advance their self-determined um, development. So, so I just want to end uh, with that. Thank you. Um. Thank you very much, uh, Joanne. Indeed, this goal is uh, very important, but quite difficult. So thank you for um, underlining continuing dialogue, collaboration, solidarity among governments, ourselves, UN agencies, and uh, the rest of society, actually. Thank you for that. Uh, now we will hear from uh, Ambassador Silvio Gonzalo, Gonzato. He's the deputy head of the delegation of the European Union delegation to the United Nations here in New York. And of course, uh, they are a key partner also in the indigenous navigator and certainly in terms of the aims of SDG 16. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, Silvio Gonzato. Thank you, please. Thank you, Joy. Uh, it's a really a, a pleasure to, to be here and I've followed uh, with uh, a lot of interest the different presentations, uh, not only by uh, the presentation on the launch of the uh, web summit uh, of the Indigenous Navigator, but also the, the testimonies made by um, all the uh, other uh, briefers on how the challenges that they meet and how the Navigator can be helpful to us. So let me say just a couple of words about the EU commitment to the cause of indigenous people. It's a commitment which is a political level, uh, first of all, and is reflected in uh, some um, important documents, the council conclusions on indigenous people that were adopted by the EU foreign ministers back in 2018. And more recently, 
in the uh, action plan on human rights and democracy that covers the period 2020-2024, where in the rights of indigenous people are adequately reflected. This action plan is really the framework that guides our action internationally in the area of human rights and democracy. But obviously words are not, in, are not enough and uh, words should be followed by action. And in operational terms, I wanted to uh, refer, as has been said by previous uh, presenters, our support to the indigenous navigator. Um, we feel that the objectives of the navigator are fully aligned with the agenda 2030 for sustainable development and in particular uh, goal 16 and you know the problems of access to justice, conflicts in indigenous territories, territories and the worsening conditions for indigenous land and environment defenders. You know, what we have heard uh, by uh, uh, different uh, friends that took the floor before me. Um, the navigator is therefore a highly relevant tool in this respect. It really empowers grassroots people uh, and grassroots communities because it gives them the opportunity to monitor the situation, to provide data, to report back, and it gives policymakers the opportunity to uh, subsume from these data policy recommendations. Um, so we are fully behind it. We support the three pillars of the navigator for a total of 7 million. And we made even an additional 1 million euro um, available in order to ensure the sustainability of this project, because it's important that it continues to operate and it continues to provide the support that is needed to you all. So um, I just let me say that I'm really pleased to be uh, today with you at the launch of the new portal, which really visualizes the data and, and, uh, and also allows participative data collection, which is extremely important to keep this project alive, particularly at the time of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has impacted your communities so, so seriously. And uh, I'm really pleased also to see how participatory this meeting is, uh, because it's really by giving indigenous people the opportunity to, to speak, to, to talk about the problem, but also to talk about the, the solutions to their problems that we can uh, you know, achieve sustainable de development also for the indigenous communities all over the world. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Um, we will also have a chance to hear from one of the UN agencies that has been a, a core partner within the Navigator Consortium. That's the International uh, Labor Organization. So our next speaker is Ms. Manuela Tomei. She's the director of the Conditions and Equality, and Equality Department of the ILO. Um, can I invite Manuela to make her presentation? Thank you. Thank you very much for this invitation and good morning, good evening, good afternoon to, to everyone. Um, the ILO is, is very pleased to, to, to participate in this event as the UN Permanent Forum uh, on Indigenous Issues is discussing the realization of uh, SDG 16 for Indigenous peoples. Uh, the ILO is a founding member and a long-standing partner of the Indigenous Navigator Initiative uh, and I would like to, to, to mention just um, a few ways um, in which uh, the engagement with the navigator has been uh, important to, to, to us. Uh, first, we, we have gained first-hand information on how Indigenous people see the progress or lack of progress in the realization of the rights and development. And this has helped us uh, to provide uh, some uh, more insightful context to the official data and has given us also uh, insights on how to improve the official data gathering to better capture the realities uh, of indigenous peoples for better informed uh, public policies. Um, the Indigenous Navigator Initiative has also offered a very concrete space for building sustained partnerships with indigenous peoples and address together the rights and development deficits that, that you face. 
uh, the data that have been generated uh, by over the last three years through the indigenous navigator, as well as the testimonies that uh, we have heard uh, today make definitely SDG 16 a catalyst for more decisive progress in securing rights and development for, for indigenous peoples. Protection from violence, the strengthening of the rule of law, effective access to justice and institutions for continued dialogue and effective participation in decision making uh, feature prominently under SDG 16, but they are very much also at the heart of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the ILO's Convention 169. Let me um, say a few words about participation in decision making, which is indeed a collective right of Indigenous people. Too often, Indigenous peoples are absent in processes when decisions about their lives and future are taken. And the COVID-19 pandemic has been a stark reminder of that. This is no longer acceptable if we are serious about inclusion and about inclusive development and leaving no one behind. To move the needle, it's definitely necessary for states to invest in setting up and maintaining institutions responsible for indigenous affairs, promoting effective coordination across the different government agencies and putting in place transparent mechanisms and procedures for participation and consultation in line with international obligations. Mechanisms for participation and consultation are very often weak or absent. And where they exist, indigenous women are often not involved to the same extent as indigenous men. And this is one of the findings of a recent ILO study that looked at the barriers that indigenous women face in decision-making processes. Uh, this means that institutions for participation need to be structured and need to be governed in ways that would indeed facilitate the engagement of both indigenous women and men from the outset. Participation is both a goal and, and a means of transformational change. Um, it ensures that the knowledge, the, the aspirations of uh, and the needs of indigenous peoples inform the design, implementation and monitoring of public policies. And as a result, these policies will be more relevant and impactful. For example, policies for decent work and social protection for the whole population may not benefit indigenous women and men to the same extent as other groups in society. In Latin America, for example, um, where some progress was made in reducing informal employment over recent decades, indigenous workers and particularly indigenous women workers remain largely confined to the informal economy. 86% of all employed indigenous women work informally. And this is why the ILO strategy for action concerning indigenous peoples sees support for building mechanism for participation as essential for the realization of indigenous peoples, social and economic rights as well. While it is very well established that indigenous peoples and exclusion and marginalization challenge social cohesion, challenge uh, uh, poverty, eradication and democracy, the COVID-19 pandemic and its devastating effects on indigenous communities has made it clear that we need to tackle this situation as a matter of urgency. Recovery will not be inclusive and sustainable without the full engagement of indigenous peoples. Uh, realizing the SDG 16 uh, for and with indigenous people and together with indigenous peoples is indeed a must and the ILO stands ready to play its part with the other international organizations, states, indigenous organizations themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Manuela. Um, we have had a wide ranging um, discussion today. We've covered issues of legal recognition, citizenship, and uh, accompanying um, social and uh, cultural and economic rights. Uh, we've emphasized uh, dialogue and the importance of uh, strong institutions. Um, having worked with the Indigenous Navigator, I'm very happy that in fact, this has become a practical tool 
to move us along on all of those uh, important issues that have been uh, brought up. So um, as we have come to the end of our uh, time for this side event, um, I'd like to thank everyone for your uh, participating in this uh, event. I'd like to thank our speakers. And um, I hope that we bring these discussions back to the UN Permanent Forum for important recommendations that they can make on this issue. Thank you very much. Um, I, are there any um, other uh, few comments that um, any of our panelists might want to uh, say to close this uh, meeting? I think we can close. Okay, so um, once more, we will thank uh, everyone who has helped us make this um, side event well attended and a success. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll close the meeting. Thank you, Georgie. Thank you very much for the organizers. Thank you. Thanks, Vital. Yeah.